soft tissue uh, treatment options in the treatment of anterior shoulder instability. I'm practicing in Ankara, is the capital city of Turkey, and I my fellow at USA, and uh, we have in several books together with the Turkish Orthopedic and Traumatology Society and also Shoulder and Elbow Society. So if we are talking about the shoulder dislocation, the Melvin Post in like uh, 1978, he mentioned that the operative treatment is indicated when the patient has three or more dislocation in a short period of time. So now uh, we don't have any doubt that uh, we operate most of the shoulder dislocations if it's recurrent. But the main issue is how do we treat it? So uh, I want to show this lady uh, and I want to ask your decision. What's your decision on that? How, how are you going to go with this lady? Do you think it's completely normal or do you think there is something wrong, but only something which is not clear? Or you offer her for the physical therapy or you say, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and shoulder expert, so I absolutely operate her or I send her to psychiatric clinic or let's enjoy our coffee. So this is the whole paradigm of the shoulder instabilities, I mean. Uh, it's a very, very famous, uh, that resembles the shoulder joint. The ball is in humeral head and we have a very small, huge, uh, small socket. So why the shoulder is unique? Because it's unique, it's most, it's unique, it's most active joint in the body with less bone stability and very high soft tissue stability. So it means that the shoulder, in my practice, I always uh, accept the shoulder uh, stability with the soft tissue balance. So when we are talking at the, about the stabilizer and the soft tissue procedures, we need to realize the stabilizers of the shoulder. So the labrum, glenohumeral ligaments, rotator cuff, biceps tendons are the main soft tissue balancer of the shoulders. On the other hand, it has just a small bone which stabilizes the which statically stabilizes the uh, joint. And in addition, we always forget about the negative tissue of the shoulder, negative joint pressure, which is very important, especially if it's arm at sight. When we start to uh, abduct our arm, the stabilization gets by the biceps tendon and rotator cuff, and especially in the throwing position, the arm at maximal abduction and external rotation. In that case, the weakest soft tissue structures are going to have effect on the stability, which called glenohumeral ligaments, especially for the anterior bundle of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the labrum as well. So uh, before we try to operate the shoulder and for the stability, we need to understand the philosophy of the dislocation. Even it's just uh, seems in the x-ray that it's a kind of like an anterior or posterior inferior glenohumeral dislocation, but it's not that all because the shoulder instability is a bipolar entity. So it affects both soft tissue on the humeral side, even on the uh, glenoid parts. So do you think every shoulder dislocation means a bankrupt lesion? It's absolutely no, because it's in the literature, it's completely shown that the bankrupt lesion, uh, you know, uh, is just a little part of the shoulder instability as a result. So uh, the question comes, what structures are affected after the anterior dislocation? I'm going to talk about the anterior instability and endoscopic dislocation in that session. Uh, as all we know, uh, starting from the like uh, clockwise uh, eff affection of the shoulder instability, the capsule first, the middle glenohumeral ligament, labrum, inferior glenohumeral ligament, and then uh, glenoid bone and the humeral head. The huge shoulder joint is affected, especially after the dislocation. And do you think what are the pro pro proportions of that tissue, how often does all these tissues are affected? So there is a very nice paper which is published in 1990 uh, called the Baker classification of the shoulder dislocation. According to that classification, there are three uh, type of injury after the shoulder dislocation. Baker In Baker one, you have just the capsular tear between the inferior and the middle glenohumeral ligament, and that's it. But however, it's very less part of the uh, injury, just 
13%. And after the first dislocation, if it goes in the Baker 2 classification, in addition to the Baker 1, you have a partial labral detachment. It's just 25 25% of the whole dislocations. But most of the dislocations, even it's the first dislocations, as you hear, it's clearly seen that the inferior glenohumeral ligament, the inferior glenohumeral ligament is completely detached. In addition, the complete disruption of the anterior labrum and also his succulation. So according to that classification, it's very clear that if the patient has a his succulation, it means that also there is a huge uh, impairment of the anterior part of the glenoid. So most of the patients, even in the first dislocation, has an, a huge soft tissue imbalance, as in that study is clearly seen. In the, uh, also, there is an, uh, in 2000, uh, in JSAS, there is a very nice cadaveric study uh, in the 33 cadavers with the shoulder dislocation, rattles, models within repetitive loading. And uh, they they find they found out that there is an irreversible capsule and ligament changes after these uh, anterior dislocation, the repetitive loading, uh, especially in the elongation in the capsule, even the ligament. This is this is uh, most common maybe uh, X-rays that we see, especially in the emerging emergency room departments, actually, and we absolutely go into and redu reduce it very softly and gently. And if this patient is a profession and it's first time dislocation, what I do? So there are several factors that affect me to before I do my decision of the treatment option. Uh, age, sex, joint stability, type of sports activity, site concomitant injury are very important for me, uh, especially if the patient is below 20, with an open physis, actually, I operate I commonly because of the, the recurrence rate is uh, huge, up to 100%. Uh, I'm, my, I'm more prone to uh, operate that patients, especially if the patient is the uh, younger than 30 years old. Uh, here, another study about the sex is a level one study, and it's clearly seen that the uh, recurrence rate in the uh, male group is about twice than the female part. Do you think laxity uh, is a risk factor for the instability? Uh, first of all, we need, to, we need to know that laxity is not instability. So they are completely different. But when laxity becomes an instability, uh, if you have pain. If you have pain plus laxity, it means that the literature says that it's going to be a risk factor for the dislocations. Uh, and there is a very nice study about that in 2012, about if the uh, laxity is the predisposition for the dislocation, it says yes. They compared the healthy patients with healthy population with the patients. On the other hand, uh, in the same year, in clinical orthopedic, in orthopedics, they concluded in a completely uh, different uh, conclusion. They didn't completely different conclusion that no, the joint laxity is not predisposition for the dislocation. So even we are talking about the soft tissue procedures, we need to, we need to think about all of these before going to the surgery. Uh, and at the end, uh, the literature much, much more says that the joint laxity is uh, prone for the recurrent shoulder dislocation. And if you are going to do any soft tissue procedures, you need to decide about also some kind of soft tissue procedures like a capsule application or something like that. And also if it's a dominant site, uh, it's more prone to uh, re-dislocate on the recurrence rates. In addition, uh, if it's in contact spore, uh, especially you need to go within surgery. Uh, this is also very important while you are uh, deciding for the soft tissue procedures, actually, because uh, even the patient has only anterior inferior uh, glenohumeral labrum detachment from the glenoid. Also, you need to explore the concomitant injuries while you are uh, fixing the uh, soft tissues. If the patient has an hagel, glad lesion, elbow lesions, uh, heel sucks, uh, even uh, concomitant rotator rotator half fears, actually it's going to be an important issue to uh, fix all this stuff if you want to deal 
uh, within shoulder instability. The most common concomitant injury is, as all we know, is the slap lesions. There are several types of the slap lesions, uh, but the most commonly, uh, especially we see the type two slap, A, A or B or A plus B type slap injuries. So actually uh, now, as far as I know, there are more than 10 classifications for the slap lesions, but if the anterior dislocation plus, plus slap lesion, we call them in type five. Uh, so we need to fix uh, both situations in the slap first. This is a very important point. And then go into the pancreas lesion in terms of uh, fixation of the soft tissue. This is the most risky position for the shoulder dislocation in the anterior uh, and the slap uh, injury. So why I'm talking about the slap uh, in all? The, the first one is it's very important because it's the most concomitant injury with the shoulder dislocation. Uh, and also the long head of biceps absolutely improves the anterior stability. In addition, restricts the entry to the station of the humeral head. So if we uh, miss the repair of the slab, especially the soft tissue procedure, just focus on the bank partition, your recurrence rate, re recurrence rate might increase. There are uh, several tests here I can show the apprehension test is the very uh, common test that I used. If they report the concomitant injuries, I use the Kim biceps load two test, both of them with the apprehension to increase the sensitivity and specificity as well. And compression rotating test, actually, it's uh, not uh, that common, but especially in the uh, hyperlex patients, uh, it's uh, meaningful. Uh, and active compression test, especially, I use it for the uh, treat for the diagnosis of the slap lesions uh, in my patients. Uh, this is the one that I use for the dynamic shear for the uh, slap lesions, especially the patients with the anterior stability. So we need to put all these tests together uh, in order to uh, improve the uh, specificity uh, and also uh, sensitivity. Uh, as all very well know, uh, there is a concept for the on and off track. Uh, I'm not going to talk about in the deeply in this concept. Uh, actually, maybe in the uh, further talks, uh, my colleagues are going to talk about it. Uh, but uh, in a very easy way, if the uh, size of the Hilsax lesion is uh, smaller than the glenoid track, uh, we call it on track, which is good. But if the uh, size of the Hilsax is larger than the glenoid track, uh, we call them in off track. And you need to add something, something to your uh, soft tissue uh, procedures. If the patient, uh, I, I prepared an algorithm for you, if it's it's the first dislocation and the patient is over 50, no concomitant injuries. I go for the conservative treatment. If the patient is below 25, uh, the risk of the recurrence is quite high and I prefer surgery at all. But the gray zone is the patients between 25 to 40. It, uh, my decision depends on the concomitant injury. The uh, existence of the concomitant injury, I generally prefer surgery rather than the conservative treatment. Uh, in my surgeries, I use uh, VCA position rather than lateral decubitis. This is my uh, choice. I have a special spider for that. It's easy access, convertible to the open surgery, and the uh, arm is completely mobile and I can do whatever I want. Uh, I prefer uh, for the uh, labral tear in the soft procedure, uh, only a single portal technique, uh, posterior uh, just for the camera and the I use, I open one anterior portal in terms of uh, doing my job and fixing the labrum. Uh, if the patient has a slap lesion, the most popular is nevesir, but uh, I prefer uh, transcuff portal, especially uh, which uh, uh, transcuff portal while uh, I'm place, placing my uh, suture anchor to the uh, zero position, uh, which is really very, very convenient for me. Uh, we can discuss this later on. If I go into the surgery, there are two main uh, stuff that I prefer. Before, my, before making my uh, surgical decision. 
As I mentioned, uh, shoulder instability is a bipolar lesion, so we need to think about the humerus and then the glenoid while we are uh, deciding for the final uh, treatment procedure. If the humeral defect, it's like more than 40% of the humeral head is off, at that time, we need to uh, prefer arthroplasty or humeral resurfacing uh, options. Uh, if the humeral head defect says like his sex is less than 25%, that's fine. Uh, we can uh, go with the arthroscopic repair for the bunker tissue. But also here is the gray zone is if the humeral defect is 25 to 40%, uh, we need to add something to our uh, soft procedure in addition to bunker repair, such as rim plissage. Uh, and also if uh, it's up to 40%, close to 40%, we need to keep in mind that we, we may have an allograft or some humeroplasty procedures might be necessary. On the other hand, for the glenoid defects, the, the critical glenoid defects is now uh, decreased uh, to 13%. I know that, but it's not uh, actually uh, a rule, but uh, I divided it in the below 20 and more than 25. Uh, if the glenoid defect is less than 20%, uh, with an on-track patients, on-track means it's good. I, ju I just go with the bunker and the pain. If the 20, less than 20% uh, by the off track, I uh, add rim passage in addition to the bunk or repair. If I have more than 20, 25% of glenoid defect, and for the on track lesions, I, uh, I prefer the Latarge procedure. And if it's uh, off track, maybe uh, I um, try to feel. Uh, the humeral defect with some craft materials. This is one of my patients that operated. Uh, so this is the recurrence uh, shoulder dislocation patient. Here you can easily see it is the drive through sign, uh, which is uh, very typical for the uh, recurrent patients and the Baker tree, type three Baker uh, injury which means that it has an hip exhalations and also uh, the uh, capsular enlargement, elongation uh, with uh, labral uh, detachment uh, very, very uh, clearly uh, seen. So this is the anterior inferior portal. In that case, uh, I used uh, two portals, but nowadays I completely convert into one portal. This is one of the one is tr uh, transport, and the other is the working portal for me. Uh, so uh, first, in in the first row, I mobilize the labrum here, and then I use uh, some uh, rasps to increase the bleeding of the bone. Uh, and then I converted it, uh, I convert the camera and I put it in the, from the interior parts actually, but it's not easy to do in the single portal technique, but even here I use the uh, uh, double cord portal from the anterior part. Uh, and then uh, I also uh, watch how bleeding is going on. Uh, later on, uh, I put uh, the manipulation shooters for the reduction of the uh, labrum. Uh, and then I put my suture shuttles to uh, reduce the labrum. And uh, I use uh, four nuts. Uh, it depends on the case. Sometimes two or three anchors, but at least two anchors with the four nuts. Here it's easily seen. Uh, I go into the second suture just under the labrum. And those and those, those are the uh, sutures that I uh, use. It's and after all, I put my second nut and I put my second anchor uh, and the third nut and the fourth nut and I finalize the operation. In that patient, it does not have any slap lesions at all. So these. Uh, at the end, I always check if the drive-through sign is absent or not. Uh, this, is, this is also another patient with the type uh, 5 slab uh, lesion in terms of the soft tissue procedure. It's clearly seen that uh, there is a huge detachment of the anchor uh, starting from the uh, 12 o'clock up to the 6 o'clock uh, clockwise injury. 
uh, I refresh the uh, labrum and also uh, provide the good bleeding uh, for the bone, first of all. Uh, and then I put my uh, two anchors. I, I put my one anchor through the transcap portal and one, I use one leg for the posterior slap repair and the one leg for the anterior slap repair generally. So this is uh, the interior part for the fixation, anterior repair. And then I go into the posterior part of the slab using my suture shuttle. It's really e easy for me to uh, open up and transcribe portal and uh, place the anchors to it. And then I reduce the uh, slab and tie my second knot for the slap lesion here. So, and then I check it, that's okay. And then I go to fix the uh, bank card lesion. So uh, this is very important that first of all, uh, you need to fix uh, the slap lesions uh, to make the anatomic reduction of the labrum. So this is the same technique that I mentioned previously. And so this is the, how does it look like? Thank you very much uh, for your attention.